Hi, I'm Sarah Morehouse, and this video will talk about ingredient substitutions for gluten-free eating. Gluten is found in all members of the wheat family, including wheat itself, triticale, and the ancient grains spelt and kamut. Gluten is also found in rye and barley. Because oats are often grown in fields that once grew wheat, and a few wheat plants kind of sneak in there, oats have gluten unless they're specifically grown to be gluten-free. If an ingredient is made from one of those things, it's easy to know that you need to avoid it. But many foods don't have an obvious reason to have wheat or wheat ingredients in them, so you have to read the labels. It's not too hard to spot flour or gluten on an ingredient label, and even if it's way down the list and there's only a tiny bit of it in there, you cannot eat it. Gluten will trigger your sensitivity on a parts per million basis. Remember, this is your immune system and your immune system is used to protecting you from a few microscopic virus particles. It is perfectly capable of mounting a full-out defense against a pinch of flour. What gets really tricky is that gluten hides out in dozens of ingredients whose names don't say wheat or flour or gr gluten. Examples are hydrolyzed vegetable protein and modified food starch. Either of those things could be made from corn or they could be made from wheat and even the manufacturer probably can't be sure which it is unless they're specifically targeting the gluten-free market. Bread is the most obvious product that you'll need to be careful of in a gluten-free diet. Unless the bread is specifically made to be gluten-free, you cannot eat it. This includes loaves of bread, rolls, flatbreads, and baked goods of all kinds. If you live where I do, in the capital region of New York, the absolute best gluten-free bread available is from the Saratoga Gluten-Free Goods Company. Their products are sold at Four Seasons and the Healthy Living Market in Saratoga, and also in the Honest Weight Food Co-op in Albany. It tastes like a whole grain bread. Its texture is a little drier and coarser than good whole grain wheat bread, but if you butter it or use it in a sandwich, it's fine. It holds together in French toast and bread pudding, and it doesn't get gummy. If you don't have a gluten-free baker in your area, then you're going to want to Udi's brand bread. You can find it in the gluten-free freezer section of your grocery store. It's in the freezer because gluten-free bread goes stale incredibly quickly. If restaurants offer gluten-free bread and they don't make it themselves, chances are it's Udi's. It's pretty well known and widespread by now. Udi's does not have a very robust flavor and it's a bit crumbly and fragile, and the loaves are quite small. But for a national brand, so far it's the best we've got. Now if you're eating at home and are willing to bake at all, the most delicious gluten-free bread you will ever eat is from Luce's Gluten-Free Artisan Bread Mix. It's a company that you have to order from online. What you get is a kit that you put together yourself. You add the specified amount of water to the flour mixture and stir. You put it on a sheet of parchment paper and shape it into a loaf, dust it with a little envelope of dusting flour, and put that into the parchment bag. All of those things are provided in the kit. Follow the instructions for resting the dough and baking it, and this is honest to heavens, nearly indistinguishable from fresh wheat bread. It's also not only gluten-free, but dairy-free, soy-free, and nut-free. They make several kinds of kits, Italian, buckwheat, multigrain, flatbread, and one that tastes like rye, but obviously isn't because rye has gluten. Now here's the downside. All of this is expensive. Bread is no longer a staple food for you unless you like paying out the nose. Expect to pay between six and eight dollars a loaf sometimes, and these are small loaves. Honestly, don't bother. Put your sandwich toppings on a bed of romaine or spring mix, or just roll up your meat and cheese together. Serve your sloppy joe over rice. But when you need rolls or garlic bread, because face it, sometimes you need rolls or garlic bread, hit up your local gluten-free bakery, or better yet, order a Luce's Gluten-Free Artisan Baking Mix Kit. Regular pasta is made with semolina or durum wheat, so it's not an option for you. However, there are a few different ways you can go for gluten-free pasta. One is to buy gluten-free noodles. If you like Italian pasta dishes, there's good news. Seven years ago when my ex-husband went gluten-free, the pasta options were either slimy and soft or stiff and crumbly. That has changed. There are two brands that are perfectly acceptable. The absolute best one is Jovial Foods Brown Rice Pasta. You can order it online, but I haven't found it in Hannaford or Price Chopper around here. The second best one, which is available in practically any decent supermarket, as well as online, is Tinkiata Joy Brown Rice Pasta. I'm probably mispronouncing that. 
They have spaghetti, fettuccine, penne, macaroni, spirals, and lasagna noodles. It really is quite good. You can tell the difference, but it's still enjoyable. You have to be careful cooking rice pasta. If you overcook it even a little bit, it will turn soft and slimy. Often, the cooking, in cooking instructions on the package aren't quite right. You need to stand over the pot and keep tasting every minute. One minute it will be crunchy, the next minute it will be perfect, and 30 seconds later it's ruined. But once you get the hang of it, this pasta is quite good. However, it does not reheat well. Stay away from corned-based pastas, or quinoa and corn-based pastas. They are gross, all grainy and crumbly. I have never met anyone who likes them, and I have no idea how they stay in business. You can also use Asian rice noodles. Their texture and taste are very different from the brown rice noodles that are meant to imitate Italian wheat pasta. They taste more like rice, and their texture is more delicate. Taste of Thai brand are easy to find in supermarkets, at least around here, and are gluten-free. A lot of people like to do this for soups because all you have to do is wait until you're done cooking your soup, turn off the heat, throw in the noodles, and wait 10 or 15 minutes. By the time your pot of soup is cool enough to eat, your noodles will be perfect. Asian rice noodles are what's called for in pad thai and pho. You can also substitute them in in a lo mein recipe. Japanese udon and ramen noodles are made from wheat, so they're right out. Buckwheat soba sound like they might be okay for us to eat. Buckwheat, despite having wheat in its name, is not related to wheat, and it has no gluten. But, buckwheat soba are deceiving because most of the time they're made with wheat and the buckwheat is just a flavoring. Any type of Chinese noodle that ends in mein, like la mein, lo mein, chow mein, seems to be made from wheat. Any type of Chinese noodle that ends in fun, like mei fun, is made from rice, but you'll need to see if the manufacturer makes sure they're actually gluten-free. You can always substitute in the taste of Thai rice noodles in a recipe because those are safe. Side note, remember that soy sauce has wheat in it unless it's specifically labeled as wheat-free soy sauce. That seems relevant while we're talking about Chinese and Japanese food. As for glass noodles, also called cellophane noodles or mung bean noodles, they're safe unless there's some kind of cross-contamination. Cellophane noodles taste great in any stir-fry or lo mein kind of dish. And then there are these shirataki noodles, which go by the name Miracle Noodle. Dieters love them because they have no calories, and they're gluten-free. I can't eat them because they're made from some exotic complex carbohydrate, and if you're sensitive to that kind of thing, they will give you massive digestive unrest. But if you can eat them, I'm told they have very good texture and flavor. Your final option for gluten-free pasta is using vegetable noodles. The classic is to bake a spaghetti squash and use the fork to comb out the strands to put under pasta sauce. That's fine for any tomato-based sauce, but it needs to be a chunky sauce. You will want to cook your sauce down by simmering it on low heat until it's reduced by quite a bit, or else your dish will be watery and unpleasant. If you want to invest in a spiral cutting device, it will cost you 40 or $50. Then you can make noodles out of any solid vegetable. Lightly cooked zucchini noodles are good under practically any kind of pasta sauce. I like raw cucumber noodles with peanut sauce or dill dressing, or thin, beet, thin raw beet noodles with citrus vinaigrette. Cooked sweet potato noodles are great under certain curries. I once made cooked butternut squash noodles with Italian sausage, fresh sage and thyme, sautéed lightly in a little olive oil with some pine nuts and topped with pecorino cheese, and it was amazing. You'll get plenty of use out of this thing if you do decide to buy it, and it's very quick and easy to use. You have several options when going for stuffing or breadcrumbs. One is to buy or make gluten-free bread and dry it in a food dehydrator or in a very low oven like 175 degrees Fahrenheit for a few hours. Then you either cut it into cubes or whir it through your food processor to make crumbs. Honestly, that is a lot of work and gluten-free bread is expensive, but it will produce the stuffing or breadcrumbs that are the closest to their gluten-y equivalent. You can also buy gluten-free stuffing mixes and breadcrumbs. I haven't really found one that's worth recommending. They're all pretty much alike. Another possibility is crushing up rice or corn checks for breadcrumbs. Checks are gluten-free and they make a great crispy coating for chicken tenders, fried chicken, fish fry, and things like that. Some people like to do the same kind of thing with potato chips or corn chips. And the last thing you might want to consider is trying something completely different. Instead of bread-based stuffing, try a wild rice stuffing. Instead of breadcrumbs, try crusting your meat in crushed and seasoned nuts. That's my favorite way to do it because it's its own delicious thing rather than being a pale imitation. It's not gluten-free, it's gourmet.
Wheat flour or modified food starch, which can contain wheat, is often used to thicken gravies, stews, sauces, and condiments. We need to use some substitutions. Just bear in mind one thing. Whenever you're adding starch to something that's already cooking, don't just dump it in. First make a paste with tepid water and then stir that in. That way you won't get any lumps. Cornstarch is often the substitution we turn to first because it's cheap. Just make sure you're using cornstarch that's labeled gluten-free. Some of the popular brands have gluten crust contamination. You do have to stir it over heat for a while before it starts to work, so don't add too much too soon or you'll over thicken. Cornstarch doesn't lose its thickening power when it's overheated or reheated, and you can refrigerate a dish with cornstarch in it. But don't freeze it unless you like sauces that have somehow turned into spongy solids. However, cornstarch will produce an end product that's glossy or shiny and has a slightly silky mouthfeel. So it's great for stir-fry sauces or anything dairy-based, but it won't work for anything too acidic like fruit pie or compote. Also bear in mind that some people have a corn allergy or sensitivity. Tapioca starch is a good thickener too, but a bit more expensive than cornstarch. Tapioca will thicken more quickly than cornstarch does. You don't have to stir it over heat for as long. However, it can leave a starchy flavor if you don't stir it over heat for long enough, so you can't add it right at the end. Tapioca starch produces a glossy, silky effect, like cornstarch, but even more so. Tapioca starch is fantastic for fruit pies and compotes. Arrowroot starch is quite expensive, and it has to be added at the very end of cooking, because too much heat deactivates its thickening power. For that reason, it can't be used in anything that goes into the oven, and it doesn't reheat very well. It does have a very neutral taste, and it's the best for last-minute thickening, because it doesn't need to be cooked in. Just don't ever use it in anything dairy-based, because for some reason, it's disgusting. Potato starch is a simple way to thicken a stew. You can dredge your pieces of meat in it before you sear them, and you can stir in some more as you need. Good stuff. It makes a nice, rich mouthfeel without the shininess of the other starches. I'm not sure if potato starch has any other thickening uses worth mentioning, though. And bear in mind that potatoes are nightshades, which are a pretty common allergy. If you need to make a roux, which means that you're basically frying your carbohydrate in fat before adding your liquid, like you do to make certain kinds of gravies and French sauces, then what you want is white rice flour. You'll make the roux just like you made the wheat flour roux, but you have to be more careful about scorching, and don't be surprised if it wants less or more fat than you expect. It's unpredictable. Start out with slightly less than the normal amount of butter, duck fat, bacon grease, or whatever you're using, and add more fat as it absorbs until you smell cooked starches. It may take longer than you're expecting, and you have to rely on your nose, because it's not going to brown up the way wheat flour does. If you wait for it to really brown up, it will burn. But with beginner's luck and or a little practice, your end product will feel, look, and taste identical to its gluten-y equivalent. I wish I could break down gluten-free baking as simple as I was able to break down gluten-free thickening. It just doesn't work that way. There is no one-for-one -one substitution for wheat flour in baking. Sure, there are gluten-free all-purpose blends that claim to be cup-for-cup -cup substitutions, but they definitely do not produce an identical product. And sometimes they don't even produce a product that's marginally acceptable. I'll go over the strengths and weaknesses of some of the popular ones. Also, there are three things you need to do if you're going to try to substitute a gluten-free flour blend for wheat flour in a recipe. The first is that you need to add a step to your recipe. You need to leave out any baking powder and let the dough or batter rest on the counter for half an hour before you mix in the baking powder and proceed with the next step, whether that's refrigerating it or baking it. The reason is that it just takes longer for the starches to take up the liquids. And if you skip the resting period, your baked goods will be grainy or greasy or maybe both. The second is that unless your gluten-free flour blend already includes xanthan gum or guar gum, you will need to add some. I prefer xanthan gum because that is less likely to give people gas. I'm not even kidding. Guar gum is very gassy. Xanthan gum bothers some people, but not very many. You can generally expect to add about a teaspoon of xanthan gum to a recipe. If you add too much, it will have a rubbery, gelatinous texture, and you'll know to add less next time. If you add too little, it will be, will be crumbly and fall apart, and you'll know to add more next time. The third thing is that if you're used to making bread with wheat flour, gluten-free flour will never give you the firm, smooth, elastic texture that you're looking for in your dough. 
Your dough will be more like a batter, ranging from the thick cookie dough batter to thin muffin batter. You do not need to knead it. Kneading is to activate the gluten, and we have no gluten. Where your recipe says to knead, just mix it until the ingredients are thoroughly mixed. In order for the bread to rise as high as you want, you'll need to create a collar for your regular loaf pan out of baker's parchment. Without the gluten, the dough just doesn't have the stretchy strength to hold the carbon dioxide bubbles that the yeast produce, so it needs more help to rise. On to the commercial flour blends. Bob's Red Mill gluten-free all-purpose flour is easy to find in grocery stores, and that's the main advantage to it. It tends to be quite dense, and the things that you make with it will have a distinct bean flavor because of the chickpea and fava bean flour in it. One thing Bob's Red Mill flour is great for, though, is traditional lard pie crust. Another is Alton Brown's brownie recipe. The bean flavor disappears completely, and the density of the flour works to your advantage. King Arthur's gluten-free all-purpose flour is also easy to find in grocery stores. People tend to like its neutral taste and the fact that it's capable of producing a fine-grained or even fluffy texture. Its weakness is that you have to be very careful to add the exact right amount of moisture. If it's too moist, it turns gummy. This also makes it unsuitable for pizza crust, and if you bake a cake, you should frost it right before you eat it, and eat it the same day. It does make excellent cakes and pancakes, though. It's okay for bread. Arrowhead Mills Gluten-Free All-Purpose Flour is another one that's easy to find in grocery stores. Word of warning, it contains inulin. Inulin is a kind of fiber that gives some people a severe case of indigestion. Also bear in mind that it contains baking powder, so you can't rest your batter or dough the way I recommended. It's also a poor choice for anything that needs to be refrigerated before it's baked, like certain cookie recipes. The reason for that is that the moisture activates the baking powder, and it uses up all of its leavening oomph before it ever gets to the oven. Arrowhead Mills mix is fine for things like pancakes and muffins, but bear in mind that it's got sorghum flour, which is naturally quite sweet, so you may want to stamp the amount of sugar or other sweetener in your recipe. Pamela's Gluten-Free Artisan Flour Blend hasn't shown up in Hannaford's or Price Choppers around here yet, but it's readily available online. It contains both potato flour and guar gum, so don't use it if you have a nightshade allergy, and be mindful that too much guar gum gives some people tummy aches. Apart from that, everyone I know who's baked with it says it's like a dream come true. The website does suggest that you may need to add more liquid when you're converting recipes, but it's the closest thing we have to a direct substitution right now, and it's ideal for making bread. Remember that because it has guar gum, you don't need to add any xanthan gum. Like I said, there's really no product that will substitute cup for cup in regular recipes to produce gluten-free baked goods just like their gluten-y equivalents. Various all-purpose blends do okay for different kinds of baked goods, but really, if you want to bake gluten-free, it's a lot more sophisticated. You end up learning about the different properties of different starches, alternative grain flours, nut flours, and plant gums. You learn that you need to use less oil or fat and more protein from either eggs or soaked chia seeds. You learn that millet can be almost weedy in an English muffin, or sorghum is divine in biscuits, teff adds a chocolatey nuance, amaranth enhances savory bread recipes with like a peppery kick. It's time consuming to learn, but it's actually a lot of fun. Baking with wheat is an established art. Gluten-free baking is still mostly uncharted territory, and it gives you room to be truly creative, and possibly discover a neat trick that nobody's tried before. Plus, you get to eat your experiments. So thank you for joining me for Gluten-Free Ingredients. Your gluten-free kitchen has many, many options, so enjoy playing around with them.